Thank you everyone for coming. This is a really good turnout and apparently we also have a couple of hundred people on Zoom. So, so glad the word, word spread about this incredibly important discussion in my mind. Um, I am the foundational director of Hunter Center for Jewish Studies and I'll talk in a second about that. But before we begin, I wanna thank a few people. I wanna thank President Rabb and Hunter College, which is the best place in the world to work out and the best place I've ever been to run Jewish studies programs. Um, I wanna thank Harold Holzer and the Roosevelt House for helping co-sponsor this. And in particular, I wanna thank our heroic and fabulous participants for joining us today. We're so lucky to have them with us. And just very briefly, the Center for Jewish Studies, um, which started about five years ago, is an interdisciplinary program where we run lots of courses in a range of departments, ranging from Israel to anti-Semitism to the Holocaust to Bible. We do a lot of uh, stuff combating anti-Semitism, different programs that we run, as well as a lot of experiential learning. One of our great professors, Aaron Welt, is here, who run, runs courses where they do walking tours of New York City, and we have Bruce Rubin, who teaches classes on anti-Semitism. Um, so it's a really great place to be, and some of our students are here today, too, which is wonderful. And, you know, I spend a lot of my time at Hunter and in the world combating anti-Semitism, and sometimes I feel like it's very important that we start to tend to our own gardens, and so that's what sort of the way that I look at this event that we're doing tonight, um, because I've taught some of the students at Hunter who have left the Hasidic yeshivas, and uh, to a student, they're brilliant and focused, hardest workers in the world, and it breaks my heart to think about the fact that they had to struggle so hard to get up to par with other students. So um, these three participants, who I'll introduce in a second, have done a huge service to us, I believe, in the Jewish community. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is this urgently important discussion exploring the recent and exhaustive New York Times report on the uh, state of uh, the secular education in the Hasidic schools, and, and I'm sure all the audience all knows about this, and also the fact that this was followed up by the New York State Board of Regents, who uh, unanimous, unanimously voted on new guidelines in the attempt to enforce educational standards, particular sec secular standards for religious schools, um, because the Hasidic educational system, as you know, received hundreds of millions of dollars in state funding, but apparently has not um, done what it needs to do to recognize nor meet the minimum uh, standards of a secular education. And um, the three top figures in the field who are here with us have all personally experienced what it meant to be involved in the school system and also have taken it upon as sort of a life mission uh, to fight for better standards for our Jewish children as well. So the way the format's gonna work is I'm gonna briefly introduce our three speakers, they'll each come up, um, and then I will field some questions to them that, that we came up together as a group, and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience for the last 15 minutes or so as well. And they're each gonna start with a short statement, five to eight minutes about their own experiences um, going through these schools. So first we have uh, the great Beatrice Weber who's gonna come up. And she's a motivational speaker, author and activist and the current executive uh, director of Yafid, Young Advocates for Fair Education, a nonprofit advocacy group working to improve secular education and ultra orthodox and Hasidic yeshivas in New York and abroad. She was raised in the Hasidic community, married to a rabbi in an arranged marriage uh, before graduating high school. Despite opposition from her community and her own family, the Orthodox Rebetzin left her marriage several years ago and now lives with her two youngest of 10 children. Um, she holds an N MBA and she filed a 2019 lawsuit against her young son's yeshiva and the New York City Department of Education arguing he was not being given adequate schooling. So, I mean, we're gonna meet some true Jewish heroes and this is one of ours today. 
Um, next is Naftali Moster, um, and he was featured in the New York Times report. <laughs> Has been a huge engine pushing forward uh, raising the secular standards. He was the founder and executive director of Yafid, so this was his foundation. He founded this organization. Uh, he was raised in a large Hasidic family of 17 in Borough Park, attended Hasidic yeshiv yeshivas, um, but left the community when he realized that he had, had an inadequate secular education. He went on to earn a CUNY BA and then a master's in social work from Hunter, so yay. <laughs> Hunter Silverman School of Social Work. And Hunter has a lot of connection with these uh, people who went through our fabulous uh, system. And our third uh, speaker is Zalman Newfield, who grew up in Crown Heights <laughs> and studied at uh, Lubavitcher Yeshivas until he was 21, where he was taught no secular subjects. In the next decade and a half, he earned a, earned a GED, a BA in psychology from Brooklyn College, and a PhD in sociology from NYU. <laughs> so fabulous. Um, he's an assistant professor now of sociology at CUNY's Borough of Manhattan Community College and the author of the widely praised 2020 book, Degrees of Separation, Identity Formation While Leaving Ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Um, and he's also the host of the New Books Network podcast. So these are our speakers. So what we're going to do now um, is each of our speakers will do sort of a, a short introduction, five to 10 minutes, and then I will ask them some questions. So Beatrice. Hi, everybody. So good to be here. So you heard a little bit about me in um, Leah's introduction. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'll just elaborate a little more on that and specifically discuss the case involving my son. So as Leah mentioned, I'm a mom of 10 children. Um, my youngest son is 10 years old, and my oldest just turned 30, which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so my youngest son is in a Hasidic yeshiva, and he's there because of a family court ruling, which um, determined that he needs to stay there, even though um, you know I'm no longer part of the Hasidic community, and I wanted to switch him to a different school several years ago. Um, in 2019, I filed a complaint against um, the yeshiva and the city and eventually the state for not providing him with an education when I realized that I couldn't change him, but change his schooling, but he deserved better. You know, I myself never graduated high school, though um, interestingly enough, the girls do get a little bit of a better education and most of what we're going to be focusing on tonight is about the boys' education. But I didn't graduate high school. but. I soon realized through my own life's journey that going to college as an adult and eventually graduating with my MBA gave me so many choices and so much power. I didn't want to deny my youngest son that opportunity, even though my older children um, did not get that opportunity and really struggled as they got older um, in, tr in getting jobs or even considering going to college. So I am in awe of these um, men who did that because it's, it's quite a, a, a journey to, to really start from scratch you know, really starting from teaching yourself the basics of grammar, writing an essay, learning the basics of science, things that we take so for granted. Um, I'm happy to say that in regards to my son, the complaint I filed against my son, finally, after three years, on, Oct on October 6th, um, the um, commissioner of education of the state of New York determined that his school was not providing him with an education and which is a big deal, the first time this has ever happened in New York State. Finally, uh, a um, determination was made, an investigation was completed. Yafed filed, uh, which Naftali might talk about, filed a complaint in 2015. It was, has not been completed as of today, seven years later. That complaint was completed because we managed to get it in front of a judge <laughs> who insisted that it be completed. So now the next step is, following up and make sure, making sure that that change actually happens for my son and for, for the hundreds of classmates and thousands of his peers across the city. Hi, my name is Naftali Moster. 
Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Borough Park, which is a very Hasidic neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, I belong to the Bells Hasidic sect. There are many sects in the Hasidic community. Um, I am the middle child of 17 kids. And um, yeah, I attended um, Hasidic yeshivas until I was 20. Um, it was around that age that I sort of began developing a thirst for knowledge outside of what was sort of being offered in yeshiva. Um, and uh, I began sort of inquiring what it means to pursue a degree. Specifically, I wanted to become a psychologist. At the time, mental health in the community was not really discussed. It was a, a stigmatized field. Um, and I saw mental illness around me, even in my own family, and I thought I'd be good at it. So um, I didn't know how to call us, how to say the word psychologist. I was 20, but um, we knew of a psycholog. And that, that's how you say it in Yiddish and in Hebrew. And there was one in the entire Bell's community. In hindsight, I don't know if he was a real one, but they <laughs> called him a they called him a psycholog. And um, and and I I wanted to become one. And uh, so that's how it all began. I um, I inquired and I walked into a local school in Borough Park, which caters. It's a branch of Torah College. It caters to Orthodox Jews, but perhaps not to very Hasidic Jews, especially men. And uh, I was literally laughed out of the place. Um, and then uh, I went to a different branch, which, which was sort of more accommodating. Um, I knew nothing when I walked in there. I literally, uh, I couldn't make sense of the signs on the walls. Um, most of the words that were said to me, <laughs> I couldn't comprehend. Um, keep in mind, you know, unlike most high school kids, they start getting exposure to college, to, to the system. Th even in high school, they learn you know, their system resembles it a little bit. There's college, uh, I mean, there's credits, there's GPA, there's a semester, there's, um, you know, core requirements and electives. We didn't have any of that. Um, so, so going into college was a major struggle. And uh, I didn't have a high school diploma. I didn't know what that was. Um, so instead, they tried to get me in a different route where you pass a certain entrance exam and then you take certain courses up front that sort of count towards your high school diploma and college credit simultaneously, but you still need to pass that entrance exam because they need to know that you're ready for college courses. And that consisted of writing an essay and doing an easy math quiz, practically. I couldn't do either. I had never heard the word essay until that point, let alone actually write one. So uh, the prompts, because it was a Jewish Orthodox college, the prompts were, were also religious. So one of them was something about the exodus from Egypt. <laughs> But I had never heard the word Exodus. <laughs> I, I had heard about Yitziat Mitzrayim, of course, um, but I had no idea what it was, so I sort of had to skip over that one. And um, I chose a different prompt that was basically, I had to make an argument whether I am vegetarian and why, or if I'm not vegetarian and why not. And I ended up doing these two big paragraphs contradicting each other, one saying that I am a, uh, a vegetarian <laughs> And the other one saying I'm not. And, and of course, the, the writing was just really poor. This was my, my struggle. Um, in hindsight, we could laugh about it. And I, I, you know, but it was, it was really, really challenging. Um, I always sort of estimated that I would have to put in four times the amount of work to comprehend what was being, you know, what, what we had to read or write. Um, because, you know, I was still thinking exclusively in Yiddish, processing information in Yiddish. And uh, we had no foundational knowledge, nothing to, to build upon. So in hindsight, I guess we still haven't even discussed the elephant in the room. My education growing up in elementary and middle school, um, we had a maximum of 90 minutes of secular education a day. And it was really more like an after school program. It took place only from 3.30 PM to 5 PM, four days a week. Friday, we finished early because of Shabbos. Um, and it, it consisted of basic English and arithmetic, if we were lucky. Um, the teachers themselves weren't qualified. The kids weren't interested. We thought it was tuma or profane. Um, so it was, a tr it was basically you know, 90 minutes of recess and trouble. Um, and this was an elementary and middle school, so a little bit of English and arithmetic, nothing else. Then once we entered high school, there was zero secular education. We got cut off from the little secular education we would receive. Um, instead, we spent 14 hours a day in yeshiva from as early as 6.30 a.m. till 8.30 p.m. studying exclusively Judaic studies. And by that, I mean literally Judaic studies. Not like we, we learned math, but 
you know, in, in, in Talmud. There was Torah, Talmud, Halacha, that's Jewish law, and Hasidic philosophy, all of it taught in Yiddish using some Hebrew, um, ancient Hebrew text. Um, and we were not, and we were surrounded only by people who looked like us and behaved like us, only like my own brothers and my father. So we didn't even have exposure sort of outside of the classroom to people of different, you know, people like you all. <laughs> um, you know, so the point is not only was our education extremely limited, but there was no room for us to learn anything outside of the classroom either. So that's sort of how this all began, and I'll fast forward. At some point, I did some research and discovered that New York State does require non-public schools, including yeshivas, to provide an education that is, quote, at least substantially equivalent to public schools, meaning they have to teach for a similar amount of time the basic subjects, and clearly our yeshivas were not complying. And that's when I formed the AFED, and uh, I guess we'll talk more as we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. It's so nice to be here with all of you and have a chance to talk about uh, these important issues. So um, when I was listening to Naftali's story, I thought, wow, this is fascinating. Because in Naftali's case, and many Hasidic um, boys in Brooklyn, they get a subpar English education for a period of um, up to a certain point, And then you know that um, is eliminated as well. My case was maybe slightly worse <laughs> because I grew up Lubavitch in the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn, and I went to Ole Torah, the flagship school of the Lubavitch community on Eastern Parkway, just um, a block down from 770, the central headquarters of the Lubavitch community. And in that school, from elementary to sort of college age, 21 years old, they do not provide any secular instruction at all. And I've told this story to many people, and I often have to reiterate it because people don't actually believe me. They say, oh, when you say that they don't teach uh, secular education, you mean they don't provide a good secular education? I say, no, they don't teach any secular education. Oh, you mean they only do it for a few hours? And it goes on and on. But this is the... Uh, honest truth, we did not learn the ABCs, we did not learn 2 plus 2 is 4, we did not learn anything um, related to secular studies from the kindergarten age till when we graduated the entire system. Um, and uh, I just want to mention that um, uh, when a friend of mine, who's Lubavitch, when I told him that I'm going to be on this panel tonight, he says, Zalman, you're going to ruin the whole thing, you know? I know, that's a real boost to a person's confidence. <laughs> you know, but, but what he meant was that because I uh, went through this religious educational system and I didn't get any secular instruction, and then I still managed to get a PhD from NYU, that shows that everything's fine. There's no problem. Look, Zalman Ufield did it, so what's the big deal? What's all the tumult about? And I think this is a, a deeply, deeply misguided understanding <laughs> of the situation. Um, it's akin to taking someone and binding their hands behind their back, throwing them into the ocean, and if by some luck they manage to get to safety, you say, well, it wasn't that bad. You did okay. You got out. You're fine. You know? And it completely ignores all of the trauma and stress and anxiety that a person has to endure in order to get to where they were trying to go. Um, and I'm also, I was just reminded, when you're talking about um, lacking basic pieces of secular knowledge at, at certain points in your life, I remember after I went to Brooklyn College uh, and got my BA in psychology, and then at that point I thought maybe I would be a clinical psychologist, so I was preparing to sit for the GRE to uh, get into graduate school, and I went uh, I made the date, I went to the GRE uh, testing center, I showed them my driver's license, and then the woman handed me this form and it basically had a paragraph that you needed to write, according to her, in script. And you needed to say that you promise not to uh, cheat on the exam and so on. And at that point I was 
in my mid-20s. I had finished my uh, bachelor's degree. I had done very well as an undergrad. And it was just a simple task to do, to write one paragraph in cursive English. And I looked at her, and I said, I can't do it. I can't write in script. I could write in print. And she says, well, no. You have to write in script in order to take the exam. And I started to cry. I was like, there were months and months that I was preparing for this exam. There were years that I was uh, going to school in order to get to this point where I could take the GRE and go and get a graduate degree. And there was this one tiny stumbling block that essentially harkened back to my lack of secular <laughs> education when I was in second grade or third grade when I would have learned this skill. So I kind of looked at her, and she looked at me, and it was obvious that neither of us you know, were going to budge. <laughs> and then eventually she said, well, you, you could write it in print, but try to connect the letters. <laughs> <laughs> I have a PhD now. I'm still not sure what that means. <laughs> but I did whatever I could, and then I kind of sheepishly handed her back uh, the form, and she said, OK, you know, go along. And I took the GRE, and, and you know, now we're here. But the point is that it, it's really important to, to um, not gainsay the, the challenges that are involved um, in trying to have a career, trying to uh, create a life for oneself if you're denied the basic secular education from a young age. And if I have one more minute, I just want to um, make one other point that um, often, I think, when we talk about when, when the issue of uh, the lack of secular education in, in the Hasidic schools comes up, uh, you often hear um, defenders of this school system try to uh, find fault in the people who are raising the issue. And essentially it becomes a game about who is the proper person to raise this, this issue. And uh, basically defenders of this uh, Hasidic school system tend to try to shoot down the messenger because they don't have an answer for the message. They can't actually uh, argue the, the issue on the merits of the, the message itself, so they kind of try to find fault in the person who's delivering the message. And I think it's important to realize that this is a, a really manipulative and, and deceitful practice. And um, the truth is, if you think about it, from the perspective of the the, the defenders of the Hasidic schools, it's sort of like a catch-22. Because if someone is a member of the Hasidic community and raises the issue of the lack of secular education, they're told, well, if you don't like it, you could leave the school. If you don't like it, you could leave the community. Well, if someone takes their advice and leaves the school and leaves the community and then raises the issue, you're told, hey, you're an outsider. You really have no standing to raise this issue. So it turns out that according to the defenders of the Hasidic community, there isn't a person alive <laughs> who is actually in a position to critique this system. Well, obviously, on its face, this is a, a, a flawed logic. Uh, we'll leave it there for now. Thank you. And you know, I probably have done 40 or 50 events in my time for Jewish studies, and I have to say, this is the most interesting discussion. <laughs> And I'm, I'm just, it's so illuminating, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna do questions that we came up with as a group now. Um, the first question is gonna bring in two questions, so ans answer whichever one you want or however you wanna answer them. Um, it's a double question. Why do Hasidic communities resist teaching secular education? And also, if you put yourself back in time to when you were in the yeshivas, how did you feel about the fact that you were not getting the secular education? For whoever, or if all of you want to answer that. So I think that that's a really a multifaceted answer to that question. Why do they resist? I will say 40, 50 years ago, um, the education was definitely better. It wasn't great, far from great, but it was definitely better. There used to be a public school teachers that would come in at the end of the day. Um, there's a family story that 
um, my uncle, who actually went to the same school that my son is in now, his teacher w thought that he was very bright and went over to my grandfather and said, you know, I think your son should go to college. Of course, that idea was shut down, but just the concept that that was something that a teacher did would be like absolutely unheard of today. The teachers that my son has can barely speak English, okay? Um, my son, who is 10, actually has to read some of the words in the readers because the teacher can't read them. So that teacher has barely you know, a second or third grade literacy level. Those are the teachers. Um, I think it stems a lot from the insularity, the idea that we want to be separate, we want to be different, which is uh, really, uh, the height of this issue is really, you know, in Brooklyn, stems from people who came here after the Holocaust, where that staying together, staying within your community became such a strong objective. Um, and also, nobody really checked in. Nobody checked in, and the community became larger, and the community became more powerful. And at this point, with so many dollars flowing there, and the amount of power that the community has just because of their sheer numbers, uh, makes it really, really hard to make any changes. When I was in the community, and I'll talk for my children more than for myself, when I, when I was a mother and had children who were in this school, these type of schools, um, we never made a decision based on the type of education. The decision was made on, did it fit, were we in that sect, and were we part, would we fit in? Um, that was what the decision was made on. And I will say that as mothers, we often would complain about it and say, oh my goodness, they just have an hour and a half, why don't they actually teach them something? But it didn't go further than us, you know, mothers complaining when we put them on the bus, because there was very little power to, to do anything and to make any changes. Uh, so that's, that was you know, definitely my experience, where there was a frust level of frustration, but also the knowing that like, we really can't do anything about this. And I'll hand it over. Sure, so <coughs> I think um, f regarding the first question, um, there are, in my opinion, there are two main reasons why the situation is the way it is, where yeshivas don't want to provide a basic education. One is the sort of the more popular one. They want to keep the kids chained. They want to keep people stuck in the community. Um, and I think, I think mo most people think like that's the only reason um, or the main reason. And I think there's a lot of truth to it. You can definitely see it. The way the right now, and we're going to get maybe to the politics in a little bit later, but like as we speak, the community leaders are just totally panicking about these new regulations and they're trying to strong arm candidates, you know, to, to agree to get rid of the basic regulations, um, you could see that there's, it's because they're afraid they're going to lose their grip on, on the people. You know, once they get an education, they can get out there. Um, uh, but I also think it's important to recognize that there are more than just one reason. Like if you have a sort of a pie, you have a few slices of the pie. Um, one of which I think is that in, in the Torah itself, it says you shall study it day and night. And I think um, some people in the community, especially the leadership, they take it to an extreme. And they believe that if you are not sleeping or eating or in the bathroom, you should be studying Torah. So to them, 90 minutes of secular education a day, um, elementary and middle school, is already a sacrifice. But once the boy reaches bar mitzvah, they're like, it has to be purity you know, for the entire uh, day. And that's why um, they don't provide them an education. Um, in terms of me growing up, the notion of an education <laughs> doesn't cross the mind of a Hasidic boy. Um, I would say 99 out of 100 boys don't know that outside of the walls of the yeshiva, education looks differently, right? We would talk down on the goyim, the, the Gentile children, and how poorly behaved they are, um, and, and they need police outside the, their schools, otherwise they'd be so poorly behaved because they don't get the, our education, but we didn't know that they learn English, math, science, social studies, and that there's a normal curriculum, and that 99% of them grow up to be you know, normal, contributing members of society. Um, so it wasn't until I was about 20 years old, um, we were sitting still in yeshiva all day long, um, and it's like 5, 6, 7 p.m., everyone is tired, they're out in the hallway smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee late afternoon, early evening, the, the shul, the study hall is practically empty, and I say to myself, this is weird. Like, 
no one wants to study anymore at this time of the day. Why don't they bring in someone to teach us something? We're about to get married, right? Because Hasidic men and women get married very young. Why don't they teach us English, math, and so forth? And I remember sort of just broaching the idea with uh, some friends in school, and they literally laughed, like, oh, yeah, sure, they're going to allow outsiders to come and teach. So obviously that's not a thing, you know. But until I was 20, the notion of an education um, didn't really cross my mind. I'll just add to that the, the first part about the motivation from the perspective of the Hasidic community in terms of why are they so um, dead set against having any secular uh, education in their schools. And I think that it has to be seen in the larger context. It was already mentioned about um, the historical period that a lot of these uh, Hasidic communities, if you look at, I don't want to get too far afield, but, but in American... Um, Jewish immigration history. People are often, they think about Irving Howe, the world of our fathers, and uh, you know Jews coming uh, uh, um, to Ellis Island in the early 1900s and so on. That was one uh, a wave of migration. But the, the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, uh, that make up the communities in Borough Park, in Crown Heights, and uh, Williamsburg, and so on, most of the people there are not from that earlier wave of immigrants. They're actually from a post-Holocaust uh, wave of immigration that came to America. And they came as Orthodox Jews, and they looked around their you know, American uh, society, and they saw what happened to the other Jews who came before them, and how assimilated they were, how acculturated they were, and they said very loudly and very intentionally, we're not gonna be like those people. We're not gonna let Judaism uh, devolve uh, the way that those Jews allowed. And so they put in uh, strictures in their community to prevent this. And uh, you see this in terms of the dress code. So if people are familiar with Eastern European Jewish history, often these uh, uh, immigrants who came to America after the Holocaust, if you look at their own family photo albums from before the Holocaust, they weren't necessarily dressed in the what would today be considered the modesty requirements. But the requirements became much more draconian and much more strictly uh, um, adhered to as a way of keeping the secular Goyesha world at bay. That that was a very intentional thing that they did. And, um, and it plays out in their ideology, in the thinking of the community, and it also plays out, I think, in their approach to secular education. That they view themselves, their community, as uh, uh, trying to create a fortress, trying to create a bulwark against the outside dangerous secular world. And they feel that to teach secular studies would be to create a, 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 um, a gap in that bulwark, to, would be to create a dangerous situation where suddenly all of these negative influences that they were trying to keep at bay were gonna rush into the community and overwhelm it. So I think it's very much tied to the kind of ideology, philosophy of these communities, and it's not, in other words, a kind of peripheral thing. This is central to um, the way that the communities see themselves and what they see as vital for their um, existential uh, you know, needs. Um, in terms of uh, my own um, experience, when I was in yeshiva, uh, definitely you didn't know a lot about secular education, but I had a tricky situation because my parents are Balei Tshuva. They joined the Lubavitch community from the outside. My father is actually a dermatologist, and he became a dermatologist before he joined the community. So it, it, growing up, and most of my relatives are not Orthodox. Uh, we're not Orthodox and are not Orthodox. So from a young age, I knew that there were people who were not Orthodox, and I knew that they had some kind of different educational background from my own. But the, the funny thing was, I remember at family uh, gatherings, people would come over to me when I was a little kid, five, seven years old, say, oh, a little boy, you know, do you want to be a doctor like your father? And, Are you crazy? I can't even read English. <laughs> I don't even know the ABCs. How in the world am I going to become a doctor? I mean, it, it seemed so absurd to me, you know? And I remember... Um, at one point, uh, I went to Yeshiva in South Beach, Florida. I have no idea why Lubavitch decided that South Miami Beach uh, would be a good place to house a Yeshiva, but they did. 
And I went there. We were like six blocks away from the beach. And I remember sitting in the study hall one night, late at night, and surrounded by the pink pastel uh, tiles in the, in the study hall. It is South Beach. <laughs> and uh, I remember kind of having this fantasy, like, wouldn't it be amazing if I went to college? At that point, I was already sort of secretly reading a lot of Goyish, non-Jewish books, what the yeshiva called Goyish books. Most of the books I was reading, mind you, were written by Jews, about Jews, <laughs> about really Goyish topics like the Holocaust, <laughs> the creation of the state of Israel, <laughs> things like that. But these were considered Goyish, at least in part because they were written in English. Um, and these, this was a very big uh, no-no to, to read these books. And I remember, incidentally, uh, at one point I heard that one of my friends had one book, and he was caught with this book. Now, this book was a particularly bad book. It was a biology textbook, and it had two subjects that were forbidden. It talked about sex and evolution. So obviously, this was terrible. Uh, but I remember he almost got kicked out of the yeshiva for this one book. And I remember panicking at the time, because I had a private stash of about 100 books that I had st you know, st stashed all around my, my dormitory. And I thought, if you could get kicked out of yeshiva for one book, what happens if they find the mother load? You know? <laughs> so this was of great concern to me. But anyway, I was already doing all this reading. And I remember thinking, wow, wouldn't it be so wonderful if I could go to college? There would be professors there, and they would teach me all of these things. And I'd be able to interact with them and ask questions, not just like with the books. They're wonderful, but you can't really ask questions to the book. Um, and then I kind of laughed to myself, like, well, of course, <laughs> I can't actually do that. It's forbidden to go to college, and I'll never be able to get into college anyway. You probably have to write an essay or something. Again, I'd never written an essay in my life, in any language, by the way, not just in English. I had never written an essay in Hebrew or Yiddish either. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I just kind of pushed it out of my mind until a few years later when it became uh, more of a reality. Thank you, and the time is flying, so I'm gonna ask one more uh, quick group question, then we'll open up to the audience. It's about the broader issue about what happened with the New York Board of Regents. Um, so if you could talk about the vote on the new guidelines, what you think about it, what you think should happen, what you think could happen, uh, where we should go to make this uh, world better for these students. I'll say Naftali, you take that. Sure. I, I mean, I have a lot to say, but I know I know you have even more to say. Yeah. And he, he worked ten years to get those uh, um, to get that vote to happen. And Naftali, if you can actually talk also briefly about the work you did to get it to happen, since you're the pers the primary entity. <laughs> wow. Okay. There's a lot. Um, so basically, uh, I, like I don't know how many of you in the audience sort of know w what happened. Um, so for years. It started off in, in you know, 2012, uh, you know, 13. I, along with a small group of people, um, graduates, went to try to speak to uh, um, education officials on the city level, on the state level. And at first, they sort of sent us to, to each other, sort of like, you go, go to the city, oh, go to the state. And, you know, finally, that's when, that's when I formed Yafed. And, um, and then we, we filed a complaint with the city in late uh, 2014. But um, they didn't do anything. Instead, when the media followed up with them, they said, well, they didn't name specific institutions, so how do we know where to begin investigating? I'm thinking, all of them. <laughs> but, you know, so what we did then was we took a few months and collected specific signatures um, to complain about very specific institutions. So we came up with 39 in New York City, um, and we submitted that complaint in, in July of 2015. New York City said they're launching an investigation shortly after but it became clear they're not really taking it seriously. And years later, we would find out that we were right. So, um, but it kind of was dragging out. And at some point, we started lobbying the state. The, the New York State Education Department is, unlike other agencies, is not managed directly by the governor. It is um, overseen by the Board of Regents. And um, they agreed to look into it and to try to um, revise the guidelines that apply to all non-public schools. In other words, not just targeting specific yeshivas, but sort of broadly um, revising the guidelines to ensure that all schools have to comply with the law. So in 2018, they came out with one version of the guidelines. The yeshivas immediately filed a lawsuit. Unfortunately, they were joined by 
other non-public schools who you know feared intrusion in the independence and so forth. The guidelines were struck out. The state had to re-release them as regulations. In 2019, they released them as regulations, but then they let them lapse. So finally, um, last month, they, um, they had introduced new regulations in March of 2022. Um, there was a lot of sort of effort and lobbying and advocacy happening in the past, uh, the preceding years. In March of 2022, they released these new regulations and then they voted on it um, this past month in September. Um, coincidentally or not, a few days before the vote, the New York Times came out with a, a, a massive um, expose. It took them two and a half years um, in the making and obviously Yafet was very instrumental in just providing um, background information, connecting them to yeshiva graduates and other sources who helped make the story a reality. Um, so I think that's that, right? And also, what do you want to see happen going forward, if you want to talk about that, too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, again, the fact that these um, regulations were passed is huge. To clarify, there is a 100-year-old law in New York State that all children need to get an education, right? This was passed um, over 100 years ago when a mandatory education came into play. And there was a question of can private schools exist? And, and the ruling was yes, they can exist, but they have to provide an education. So what was um, ruled on now was specifically how it should be implemented. It never was challenged. Nobody ever looked at, okay, but what does it look like and how do we get there? So that this was this was a big step. It actually provides a process whereby each, each um, area has to make sure that they have a list of the private schools, because right now, there's no accountability. Nobody even knows in each school district who are the private schools. So if they don't even know who the private schools are, how could they actually ensure that they're providing an education? But I think it's important to mention that there are many loopholes and many issues, okay, with these guidelines, and that's something that Yafet's going to be continuing to work on. You know, some of the of the loopholes are so big that the school, uh, some schools that don't teach anything can really just float through those holes. So that's something that we're going to be looking out on and I don't think we have time to go through what those issues are, but there are serious issues that we need to continue um, working on. So we're gonna open it up for a few minutes for questions. I have a bunch more questions, depends on how many questions we have. Um, and um, Malki is going to uh, give the audience uh, the time to ask questions. I was thinking just today about the political implications of this because what I'm thinking is I know the communities vote as a block and the mayors have been reluctant, it would be polite to, to challenge them in any way. And what I'm thinking is how do people even read a, a ballot to vote? Um, and like we have these four, I don't know what they are in the back, but um, I'm not sure I agree with any of them, but I've read them and I've thought about them with my secular education. So I'd like to understand the political, and I think the political control and what happens to the money that gets given by the state and the city to the schools is a very large part of this. So thank you. Um, yes. So the politics is uh, is huge. So I want to I want to respond. We have to be careful not to sort of caricaturize people from the community. Most people, even I, as a twenty year old, growing up with very little education, very little exposure to English speaking people. There's, we, we could say sentences in English. Sometimes it's broken, but we could say it. If we had to go to a doctor and explain our symptoms, we needed our parents or, or our sisters. But there were certain things like you could read. And especially um, when it comes to voting, the community makes sure to train you how to vote. <laughs> That's, they, send home, they send home sample ballots. It shows you exactly who you should vote for. And for the weeks and months leading up to it, there's so much discussion you know, about it. As we speak, I mean, my phone is blowing up with this stuff. Every few hours, another community leader comes out 
you know, um, endorsing a candidate. And as we speak, this is the hottest issue. It's kind of astonishing to me that most New Yorkers go are going about their day not even realizing that potentially the thing that's going to decide the, the, who the governor of New York State is is going to be yeshiva education. Because, because people um, in the community are just furious that Governor Hochul allowed these regulations to pass without interfering and without calling them out and without going against the Board of Regents. And they are so furious at her that that's gonna be one major reason, and they've said it in all their Yiddish language um, election materials, that therefore they are pushing for um, Lee Zeldin, right? So it's just, w you know, people can make all kinds of decisions. We're not gonna endorse anyone here, but it's, it is important for New Yorkers to understand that this is an issue that impacts them. People always used to be like, well, it's a community onto themselves. Who are we to tell them how to live their lives? No, 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 they vote on issues that impact all of us, all, all of New York and everyone. So it is important for the rest of the state to feel like, you know, at least people should have an education, should know what they're vot voting on. So for instance, when you vote on an issue like um, the environment, like there was a, a question about plas banning plastic bags, right? You can have an opinion about it, but if you don't know anything about science and about the, the atmosphere and the ozone layer or whatever, or how the oceans are being impacted by it, because you never ever learn anything about it, then and you then vote because you want to be able to go shopping for Shabbos and come home with 60 plastic bags, that's, that's a decision that <laughs> impacts the rest of society. Um, and the same is true, obviously, with other issues. Thank you. Hi. Three quick questions. Number one. We're going to have to do one question each because the whole audience It's wants like to one more answer. How many people are, are there? And um, not knowing math, how do you run businesses? And, you know, questions of, of, of that ilk. Those are the two quick questions. Numbers are a good question, and that's something we're looking at defining them. But it's between 60 and 100,000 boys, okay? Because girls, it's separate. Um, in terms of businesses, uh, very often, people will have women working, and if any of you have interacted with the Hasidic um, business, often th there will be women who are the secretaries who are really helping. And again, some people figure out math and have calculators, you know, but there's definitely, you'll have like women at the front lines a lot doing a lot of that administrative kind of work, where and you'll have like kind of the man being the owner and the one kind of maneuvering things, but the one who's actually doing the technical work will be the women who um, oftentimes are very, very bright, and th that's their only, op those are one of their only w work opportunities, like working for somebody in the community. So with, with the education that's available, let's say, to the boys, um, what jobs are available? Is there, what, what are 100,000 kids growing up without education, what jobs are available, and also what's the average socioeconomic status? that I would see as a result of that? All right, so I don't know if there's really a great data on the granular level of exactly um, you know, how much money the average Hasidic household is making. There's a lot of problems with some of the data that does exist, like census data that shows that uh, Curious Joel in uh, um, Orange County is the poorest um, village in the w America and things like that. And there certainly is poverty, but there's also issues about the reporting of income. So, you know, there was also a story in the New York Times uh, about the, the scandal related to the financial misconduct on the part of the yeshivas. There was a lot of pieces to it, but one of them was that the yeshivas were deliberately um, maneuvering the wages for their employees in order, so essentially they were giving them part of their wages on the books and part of their wages off the books so that those teachers could then um, uh, get subsidized housing, get um, food stamps or whatever other government aid. And I, I know <laughs> I, I, I know a lot about this particular issue. I have a lot of relatives who work <laughs> in the Crown Heights community. The ar article was about Williamsburg, but there's very similar things happening in Crown Heights as well. So anyway, it's hard to know exactly what's going on, but we do know, I mean, there's basic national data about the correlation between education at attainment and income. 
and the, 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 the data is very, very clear. People who have a high school diploma make more money on average than people who don't. People who have a college degree make more than people who have a high school degree. People who have a post-baccalaureate degree make more than those who have a BA. So this is very, very clear uh, uh, statistics, and obviously it also applies to the Hasidic community. So there's no question that the fact that they are uh, and uh, the, these schools are not providing a secular education for their students is uh, potentially hindering their ability to th for them to make a decent living. I'm going to repeat the question back because of Zoom. So the question was if the Hasidic community then is hiring them themselves. All right. So, yes, there certainly are jobs within the Hasidic community. People are, are teachers. People are, are, are mashkichim. They give the uh, kosher certification for food. Uh, they they you know, do all kinds of jobs within the community. But it used to be, well, anyway, the, the point is that there's a limit to how much you could have jobs internally if there's no money coming into the community from the outside. And of course, there are some professionals, people who grew up with this limited or, or, or complete lack of secular education and then sort of miraculously managed to get bachelor's degrees, become accountants and you know, speech therapists and so on. But the, the, it, it's very difficult to do that. Thank you. We know that there are yeshivas, day schools that do a great job in terms of secular education, the non-Hasidic ones. Why are they supporting the Hasidic yeshivas now? Do you have any idea? I don't think it's necessarily true that they are supporting the Hasidic yeshivas. Rather, they're acting a little bit selfishly, or they did. Uh, maybe now it's not the case. But at some point, when the new guidelines came out in 2018, and then subsequently they turned into regulations in 2019, it was impacting all the non-public schools, as it should. Every, every restaurant, even if they're a five-star restaurant, they have to undergo a review every year by the health, inspec you know, a health inspector. So should non-public schools. But they've operated for so many decades, as Beatrice said earlier, without any oversight. So suddenly they're like, if they can fight against oversight, why wouldn't they, right? And, un, and, and you know, as for the Hasidic you know, kids, you know, they be damned, you know? So it wasn't necessarily that they were defending the Hasidic yeshivas. Now there are some Litvish yeshivas, they're sort of ultra-Orthodox but not Hasidic. They do tend to provide a better education. Um, and in general, they speak English at home, they tend to, you know, go to college, at least many of them. They for some reason have come full on to the defense of the Hasidic yeshivas. Uh, it's mainly led by a group called the Gudef Israel. It's a, it's a very powerful lobbying group. Um, and essentially, in my view, it's basically that they were, f they were worried that they would essentially be, um, go out of existence or, or not be necessary anymore since the Hasidic community is growing much faster and much more powerful, even by sheer numbers, as Beecher said, and therefore, Agudath Israel, the Litvish um, lobbying group, came to their defense, and they've been working together all these years to ward off any uh, oversight. If I could just add one thing about this. Um, my, I just mentioned my father, who's very Lubavitch, very orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Jew, he actually wrote an article in the Jewish press, which is also very Orthodox, and uh, he supports, by the way, what the Hasidic yeshivas are doing. I want to be very clear. Even though he's a doctor, he supports what they're doing, and he has you know many grandchildren, male grandchildren, who are you know being deprived of a secular education. But the reason I mention his op-ed is because he said in the op-ed that the uh, you know speaking to to his own so to speak, he said we should be honest about what we stand for. That now there's actually a real. Uh, uh, a manipulative campaign, a real campaign of deception. We are uh, um, less orthodox or less ultra-orthodox schools that provide a solid secular education are pretending to support the Hasidic yeshivas that provide no secular education, and the Hasidic yeshivas in turn are saying, yeah, publicly, look, there's nothing wrong with our form of education. Look at all these schools that have children that go to Harvard. Those are not their students. This is like a, like a, a con game, like a, 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 um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bait and switch. 
they're talking about apples and oranges. And my father said, and this part I agree with, if you really support ideologically the complete uh, removal of secular education from your schools and from your community, at least have the conviction to stand up and say so. Don't play games and try to pretend that you do provide school uh, secular education, you don't provide secular education. If this is what you're committed to, be open, be public, and then try to defend that position without trying to, to, to mix um, uh, apples and oranges here. Thank you. So given what we know from the reporting about the misuse of funding to support this system of education, have you given any thought to what could be a more appropriate and sustainable system of funding to support uh, an educational system with higher standards? The, the problem with the funding issue is there, there may have been particular laws you know, and procedures that were violated, but the real issue is that the way that the Hasidic uh, community operates and the number of children that they have and the, the limited jobs that are available to them because of their lack of secular education, it's simply not possible for them to fund their schools by themselves. It just can't be done. The math will not sustain it. So they have to get the money from somewhere. And I was recently in Crown Heights after that story broke, and people said, well, what do you want? It's not like we stole the money and you know, went to Florida on vacations. I mean, we used the money to run the schools. Of course, what we did is not technically legal, but I mean, you know, we were using it for a good reason, you know, we're, we were using it for a good purpose. In other words, um, yes, the people, the individual people who were involved in those things, they could be slapped on the wrist or whatever. They're already working out deals. They'll give back a tiny percentage of what they took or whatever. But the larger issue is that if the communities are going to keep on operating the way that they have till now, if they're going to provide or, 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 or prevent the provision of secular education and the attainment of, of decent middle class jobs, they're not going to have enough money to be able to run their schools and their communities on their own. Thank you. And we have time for two more questions. Hi, good, uh, good evening. So this is not so much a question. Um, I do want to first of all thank you all for uh, coming here and putting yourselves out, out here in front of everybody to discuss this issue. Um, I do feel similarly that more people should know about it. Um, I want to mention something that came up earlier. I myself am a Hasidic yeshiva educated uh, graduate as well. And somebody mentioned something about the economy and the ecosystem and the sort of um, professional opportunities that exist within the Hasidic community. And I felt that uh, there was opportunity to expand on that. So with, with respect, <laughs> I'm going to try to do that for a second. Um, the, the, nobody's arguing that there's something deficient with the, with the entrepreneurial abilities inherently of Hasidic people, of course. Uh, you know, many people who don't speak English um, are, are are very um, capable of sort of doing business, as it were. I would I would argue that this creates, if anything, more a system of, of haves and have-nots within the community because there are people. There is an entrepreneurial um, percentage of society that's going to sort of make it despite their obstacles, and th and they do. Um, there are areas where you can make money without uh, without a you know without an advanced education, um, and then what people do is they have the ability to s open businesses and they do hire. Um, to a large degree, other Hasidic people. And what this does is, this actually, what it does is it allows you to survive within the community, but it also does end up limiting your opportunities and your ability to, to your mobility within a specific ec economy or, you know, there are large sectors of, of many money-making um, businesses that are dominated by ultra-Orthodox people. And I don't want to pretend like that's not the case and people see this and say, well, you're making a lot of money. Well, that's certainly true. There are, there are you know, people who are very successful in business and they sort of spread that within the community, but, but that's also a, a tool to keep people trapped and that does not replace a, a one's own ability uh, to move in society. And of course, that should be the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so we have one final question, um, but the speakers will probably stay for a few minutes if people want to come up. I but because we're on a Zoom format as well, we have to wrap up at, uh, after this question. I guess my question is, do you know how does the state reconcile the fact of funding a school that doesn't educate their students? H how do they do that? So I, I just want to explain how these schools are funded. 
it's not like schools get blank checks at the beginning of the school year. They're, it's very complicated. They get s money for busing, they get money for textbook, they get money for school lunches. I think because it's so complicated, and, and I know, you know Yafet has tried kind of to tally up all that money. I know the New York Times report spent a lot of time trying to understand what were the sources. Um, I think the complexity of how they receive the money, some are state dollars, some are city dollars, some are federal dollars, it makes it really hard to track. And, and none of the money is actually given uh, for direct um, you know, Judaic education. It's for a, a lot of the wraparound services, and it's hard to track. But I think now they have to start contending with it as, as this is cracked down. But just to clarify, the requirement to provide an education is aside from the funding issue. They're really two separate issues. Even if a school receives zero dollars, they still have to provide an education. I'll just add, that being said, the new regulations make it very clear that if a school is found to not be substantially equivalent, there's a whole period of time they could remediate, but at some point, the local school district does have to cut off all the funding. And that's essentially the state's only tool at the moment that we know to put a school out of business. That and sending home letters to the parents saying that their kids are essentially truant. So it's a very extreme measure. Up until that point, there's a lot of remediation. But as a final um, remedy, they do strip the school from funding. And um, do any of our speakers want to make any final points that we didn't cover before we wrap up? Or did we, we hit all of our... I'll just say one thing. I want to thank you for coming here. Our Hasidic children don't have much of a voice. There are leaders that speak up a lot for the community, and there are very few that speak up for the children. So I want to thank you all for coming here on behalf of the Hasidic children who deserve an education just like every other child in New York City and New York State. Thank you. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, yes, oh. and go ahead. I was just going to add, uh, very similar to what Petra said, like, you know, you all have permission, in fact, a moral obligation to speak up for these kids. Th there, is, there are people crying from within, calling for help. We at Yafet have always gotten these kinds of um, tips and calls um, from people, and we can't do it alone. We can't go up against the tremendous, um, you know, the block vote and the power structure. Um, years, decades and decades of lobbying and, and cultivation that our opponents have been doing and they're now cashing in on, right? W there's no way a small organization <laughs> like Yafed and a handful of activists can do it ourselves. We need people from the broader public to join forces and use your power both as a voter, as a, as a donor, um, you know, as, as an academic and, and so forth to spread the word and to make sure New Yorkers take action to once and for all uh, resolve this issue. And just one final point, um, as the director of Jewish studies, I feel emphatically the best thing we can do for Jewish studies is to educate well our children. So thank you everyone for coming um, and joining us tonight.